I wouldn't say I prefer gibbons to other monkeys. I'd simply say that I was intrigued by gibbons from the start because they seemed unique and people didn't really know how to look after them. So I tried to learn about them by observing them for years. And as I was growing up, I also came to understand the issues around monkeys. So the desire grew to go out into the field to help them, to do something practical. When he was only 18 years old, Aurélien Brulé left France and went to seek out Gibbons. After a few months in Thailand, where he was nicknamed Shani, which means Gibbon in Thai, he went to Indonesia, to the second largest jungle in the world, that of Borneo. Shani quickly realized that the Gibbons situation was very uncertain. So he decided to get involved and to set up a first rehabilitation camp for gibbons on Hampapak Island. At the start of the project, I chose an island for the project infrastructure because if a gibbon ever escapes from one of the aviaries, it's still confined on the island. So if it's infected with any human diseases, it won't pose a risk to the wild populations in the forest. The Calawet Association, founded by Shani in 1999, doesn't only look after gibbons. Other animals in distress are also taken in. This hornbill called Graham arrived here about a year, a year and a half ago now. One day we saw someone drive up to the office with the hornbill on the passenger seat of the car. He spent some time in an aviary first, and now he's free. And he spent so much time with humans, that's why he's often on the ground. But the good thing is that he does sleep in the trees. So as time goes on, I hope he'll become more independent. We sometimes have to intervene to save animals, and that goes from snakes, by lorises, small primates, to tortoises, monitor lizards, to bears. All the animals we receive here have been victims of humans. With the gibbons, most of the time the poachers kill the mothers in the forest to catch the babies and sell them as pets. The Calouette team has to be ready to act quickly to increase the chances of survival for animals kept in captivity. Shani has just received a call. He has to go to Palankaraya on the island of Borneo. Accompanied by Danny, the coordinator at the Palankaraya Treatment Center, Shani makes his way to a residential neighborhood. Danny has explained the situation in a bit more detail. This person asked for money yesterday to try to sell the gibbon, which we refused. Danny managed to convince him to give it to us, but we're always scared that the person will change their mind. And especially when I saw the conditions the gibbon was in, in this small box, in the rain, etc., there was no question of leaving without the gibbon. What we hear when we pick up an animal like this is that the people thought a monkey was fun. They don't understand the tragedy of the situation. So we're a very long way from people becoming aware. Gibbons are very fragile apes. I'd say that one time in five, we receive the gibbon and we know it will die in the next five days because it's already in a very poor condition. The mortality rate among gibbons is one of the highest. Even if it's not very nice to talk about it, it's the reality. Working with gibbons means talking about the death of gibbons too, especially when you're in a country like Indonesia where gibbons are sold on the black market.
It's been kept in very bad conditions. Imagine spending weeks or months in a box like that. It's crazy. This is an emergency. It doesn't look healthy. You can see the eyebrow ridges, and that's a bad sign in Gibbons. I don't know how long it had been in that box in the rain, and I can tell it's very stressed and in a bad way. So I need to take it back to the project as quickly as possible. That's why we're going straight to the port, to go back to Callawhite. Time is short. To prevent the gibbon dying, Shani accelerates up the 50 kilometers of river separating him from Ampapat Island. Saving a gibbon means working in a hurry, but it remains to be seen if the animal will survive. For Shani, creating the first gibbon sanctuary in the world wasn't a crazy idea. In Indonesia alone, over 6,000 gibbons live in captivity in people's houses. So far, the Kalawayat team has been able to remove 300. Gibbons are very susceptible to certain diseases, and that's why special precautions must be taken. In Kalawayat, we always wear masks when in contact with the gibbons to stop the gibbons catching a typically human disease which is called herpes simplex. It sounds like a complicated name, but it's the cold sore that humans often get when they're a bit run down, etc. In the gibbon, it causes encephalitis, and the gibbon simply dies in four days. First, we palpate to be sure there are no pellets of shot in the body, which there frequently are. The poachers kill the mother with air rifles, and the baby is hanging on to its mother and also takes some pellets. Oof, he's got a toe that's completely broken, fractured. We have a problem here because the gibbon is so dirty. We don't often see a gibbon in this state. He's not thin, but he's extremely dirty due to the water and all the dirt in his little wooden box. So we're going to shampoo him. Once we receive the animal, we will, we will name the animal uh, and we will put uh, the animal in the quarantine uh, cage. Uh, by that, we, we will record the, the, the cage number and then with the name of it. The new arrival, named Shampoo, gently regains consciousness. Not far away, to check, a gibbon who arrived on the island seven years ago is patiently waiting for the moment when he'll join a female chosen for him. In the meantime, something unexpected has happened. Last night, a female called Bebe escaped from this enclosure, a female macaque, so the team's trying to catch her. She's just gone back inside. Because the team was trying to catch her, she got scared and went back inside the enclosure. That doesn't mean she won't try to get out again tonight, so I'll spend the night here tonight. If she does get out again, I'll be able to see where she's getting through. Looking after gibbons takes a considerable amount of work. Shani relies on a team of devoted people several of whom come from the local communities. I bring in the people I need. I don't claim to be a vet or a botanist. It's really multidisciplinary. And that's why I think that even if you start at 18, if you have the maturity to create a project and to bring in the right people, you can make it. He started this program in, in a very, very young age. Uh, his idea that 
he would like to include the participation of the local Indonesian to be to to protect the, the nature and the wildlife. So I think that's a good point that I have to support him always and change the, the way of Indonesian thinking about how to protect the nature. I arrived in Indonesia with a limited idea of the situation. I thought, gibbons, full stop. I realized there were people here and that gibbon conservation can't succeed without the involvement of the local population. You have to inform them about the particular problems of gibbons, but you have to become a partner of the local population to protect the forest. So the villagers themselves defined the limits of the reserve. When the villagers, the people, in inverted commas, have said yes, it's hard for the politicians to say no. In addition to creating the Hampapak Reserve, Shani also developed another rehabilitation camp in Sumatra. In Palankaraya, the creation of the Kalwed FM radio consolidated the organization's links with the community. OK, who wants to dedicate a song to someone like our friend Ari? It turns out that it's one of the most listened to radio stations, and above all, over 60% of the animals we receive in Calawite come with the help of listeners. One listener who has a gibbon and gives it to us is someone who has understood the importance of giving it a second chance of going back to the wild. One aim of the radio station is to raise awareness among young people about ecological problems and animal conservation. But Shani partly finances the association via the internet. We have a program of sponsorship, of adoption, which consists of getting people to sponsor a gibbon for the year. People can choose a gibbon from the list, which is always online on the internet. And that means the person can get attached to that gibbon and over the years get to understand the issues of gibbons in general, but also those linked to that particular gibbon. Shampoo, the gibbon rescued a few days ago, is out of danger. Shani is hopeful that he'll be able to be paired with a female in a few months. Meanwhile, the time has come for Tchek to join his companion in the aviary. The formation of new couples is an essential part of the rehabilitation process. As gibbons are very territorial, they can only defend their territory as a pair. We're going to try to catch Czech in order to put him into a big aviary with a female to form a pair on the island. The best thing would be to catch a foot or a hand to anaesthetize him, because with the blowpipe there's always a risk. When you shoot with a blowpipe or a gun, you only aim at the haunches. I hit him in the top of the thigh, so it'll take around 10 to 15 minutes and he'll go to sleep. Then we'll take him directly to his future female, who's called Sri. Czech has just woken up. As in all couples, there's always one dominant partner and one subordinate. There will have to be a bit more interaction for the gibbons to understand who's the boss, in inverted commas, in the aviary. When we put a pair together, the first 40 minutes are always important. The first exchanges between the two gibbons seem to go well. Rehabilitation is a long process. Sometimes several years are necessary before the primates are ready to return to their natural habitat. Not far away from the aviary, Bebe, the female macaque, has escaped from her enclosure again. There's always a risk of being bitten. But when you're catching a female in these conditions, she'll always be subordinate in relation to the male, whether he's human or macaque. She knows the difference between humans and macaques, but it's just that her life is conditioned by a system of dominance, of dominant and subordinate.
The next step is to get a hypodermic gun, because after my failed attempt, there's no chance of her coming back as close to me as she was. And before we have that kind of success, she'll have taken the camp apart. At the Hampapak camp, Shampoo is doing better and better. In their aviary, Tachek and his companion are learning the behavior that will allow them to be set free. As for the female macaque, the situation is becoming more and more worrying. This time the team managed to catch her. In fact, she ran away into the flooded forest. They shook the trees and she fell into the water and they caught her at last. It's not always as hard as this, but it's not always an experience. But she escaped for about a week in total, between the times when she came back in and went out again. So there we are. End of the joke. Releasing the gibbons into the wild, with all the dangers lying in wait for the former residents of the sanctuary, requires monitoring. That's why Shani regularly goes into the reserve. In these 4,000 hectares of protected land, preserved in its natural state, several species find shelter. In the reserve here, we have seven species of primates, including orangutans, gibbons, proboscis monkeys, a lot of birds, a lot of snakes. This kind of forest is a paradise for pythons. It's like a larder with all these other animals. So they can be in the trees or in the water. A while ago, Shani and his team caught a python on the edge of the Hampapak camp. Catching this impressive reptile required the intervention of several men. Shani made the most of it by filming the event. It's a super python. It must be at least three meters long. And a python like this can grow up to eight or ten meters. It's the second largest snake in the world after the anaconda. A python of this size can easily kill a man and swallow a child of four or five years old. We'll microchip it and release it today a long way from the island so we can be sure this python won't bother the primates in Calawite anymore. OK, OK, be nice. We can do this. No, 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 no. No, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. It's not only the predators in the swamp that threaten gibbons. The fate of the Indonesian forests is also of great concern for their future. The deforestation rate in Borneo is one of the fastest in the world. If it's that fast, and what scares me now, after 10 years, is what will happen in the next 10 years. What I've seen in 10 years is pretty disastrous. And day after day, the gibbons are losing hundreds and hundreds of hectares. That means they're being squeezed and they're dying. As gibbons are very territorial, if one area of forest has disappeared, it doesn't mean the gibbon has moved. Yes, it will certainly have tried to move, but it will have been killed by other gibbons for territorial reasons. So they can't share a smaller forest. The problem is that now, after 30 years of forest exploitation, a palm oil company will come in and cut down everything that's left to establish a monoculture of palms where nothing lives anymore. With this amount of lost habitat, reserve projects like the one in Hampapak are even more necessary for the survival of the species. 
Gibbons, like several other primates, move using brachiation, so hanging from the branches. But the difference from other apes is that they've specialized in this mode of movement to the point where they've developed longer arms than other monkeys. A gibbon that's always lived in the wild will never set foot on the ground in its entire life. That's why it's so important in the rehabilitation process to get them up as high as possible. That's why we chose Hamperpack Island. So if they sing, if they mate, if they don't come down to the ground, if they don't show any more interest in humans, we judge that they're ready to be released. As the gibbons are very hard to monitor, we try to make platforms in the forest where we can look out for them and listen to the gibbons. By singing, first of all, they're telling us they're in good health. They're also telling us that they're confident enough to mark their territory. That's very important, especially for the animals we've released into the forest. By monitoring them or listening to them for about 10 days, we'll know roughly where they're living in the forest. Like dozens of other gibbons returned to the wild, Shampoo, Tchek and his companion will soon be able to take the path to freedom. These releases are very special moments for Shani, giving meaning to so many years of his work. We now have nearly 300 gibbons in Kalawite. It's the largest captive population, the biggest gibbon conservation project in the world. But by working on the root of the problem, when we go and collect gibbons, like when we got that gibbon out of the box a few days ago, the fact of taking it out of those conditions and giving it a better, decent life in Kalawite is already a source of satisfaction, even before you think of releasing them. The first thing is to try to appease their suffering, and all these small victories mean that you do feel that you're useful. <laughs> 